This is the pre-lecture video for the first part of chapter four. We'll be talking about solutions, electrolytes, acids, and bases. So let's begin with some simple definitions. A solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. This whole chapter is on aqueous solutions. That is simply, of course, solutions where water is the solvent and then we have something dissolved in water like a solute particle. So a solvent is the substance present in greatest quantity in a solution. All other substances are solutes. So water is a solvent in an aqueous solution, and then we can dissolve things like methanol or sodium chloride, sugar, all different kinds of things in water, and try to characterize the property of the particular particle that's dissolved in water. Now, to get a little bit of terminology down pat, methanol happens to be a liquid at room temperature. So CH3OH happens to be a liquid, at room temperature. Something like sodium chloride happens to be a solid at room temperature. Um, so whenever we're dealing with liquids, they usually will either mix in all proportions with something like water. So you can think about having a solution perhaps of a lot of water and a little bit of methanol. That mixes very easily. And then likewise, you can have a lot of methanol and just a tiny bit of water and they still mix together perfectly fine. So liquids are usually either miscible so we often hear a term called miscibility or miscible. So those are liquids that mix in all proportions versus soluble. Soluble is a, a term we give ionic compounds or just compounds in general that dissolve um, in water that are solids. So a solid we would characterize as being soluble versus insoluble. So NaCl happens to be pretty soluble in water. You can get about 350 grams to dissolve in a liter of water. So I'd say you know, dissolving 350 grams of something and about a kilogram of solvents, pretty soluble. Now, we'll be classifying things in this chapter as soluble versus insoluble. And, you know, you can probably imagine that solubility for different types of compounds is probably a continuum. That some compounds are very soluble, some are probably negligibly, negligibly soluble, and other compounds are probably very insoluble. But we'll be classifying things as either being soluble, like NaCl, PBI2 is a good example of a compound that is insoluble in water. So it doesn't dissolve in water, and would just remain as like a solid at the bottom of, say, a test tube if you're trying to dissolve lead iodide into water using a test tube. Okay. So we can define and look further into aqueous solutions. If we have an ionic compound that dissolves, it's going to dissociate. So if we have something like sodium chloride, dissolving in water, then the Na cations will be surrounded by water, and then the chloride ions will each individually be surrounded by water. There's a very interesting, let me um, zoom in for this for a second so you can see this, that notice how the oxygens are surrounding the positively charged sodium cation. So we have a positive charge on sodium. We see the oxygens surrounding those. We're going to see in chapter 8 that that's because water has a um, um, a small charge built into it, something you call a partial charge. And then hydrogens have a partial positive charge, so that partial positive charge in the hydrogen surrounds the negative charge, and then the partial negative charge is surrounding the positive charge in sodium. Now, this whole process here is how any ionic compound dissolves in water, that the ionic compound fully ionizes um, into its constituent ions as it dissolves in water. So now something like methanol doesn't do the same thing. So if you look at methanol, it remains intact. It remains intact as a CH3OH molecule in water, where it doesn't fall apart and ionize in the same way that sodium chloride does. Now this leads to a pretty big difference in solutions between things like sodium chloride versus things like methanol. The ionic compounds lead to ions. Molecular compounds often don't dissociate in the same way. And so we're going to define sodium chloride to be an electrolyte or form an electrolytic solution. So this is an electrolyte. And what that means is that the solution now will conduct electricity. Water actually doesn't conduct electricity very well. But if you dissolve sodium chloride into it, it will conduct electricity much better. Methanol dissolved in water really has about the same conductivity. So this would be a non-methanol would be considered to be a non-electrolyte in water. So think about a term non-electrolyte as being a property of a compound when it dissolves into water. Does it lead to um, a conductive solution? We term that to be an electrolyte or a non-conductive solution, hence a non-electrolyte. And we'll even see some examples of things that partially dissociate 
as we continue. So some molecular compounds we'll see partially dissociate. So we'll see a term um, given like strong electrolytes will be things that completely dissolve and ionize like NaCl. And then non-electrolytes for things that don't ionize at all like methanol. And then we'll see some compounds that partially dissociate in water and make a few ions, but not a complete ionization. So we'll see some examples of those as we continue. Okay, so we see here electrolytes um, strong electrolyte dissociates completely in water. And so if we take something like pure water and have an electro, uh, two electrodes that if they were um, joined together, the light bulb would light up. The light bulb's not lighting up because water doesn't conduct electricity very well. Now, don't let that fool you into taking a bath with your toaster. You know, so water conducts enough to kill you. So you don't want to throw um, electrical items into or take them into, you know, a shower or a bathtub, of course. But water doesn't conduct as well as it would if you add something to it like sodium chloride. So dissolve sodium chloride into water and all of a sudden the light bulb lights up. The ions act as almost a wire to unite the electrodes so that the light bulb can light up. If we could just touch the two electrodes together, the light bulb would light up. But if we have ions to help unite them together, then the light bulb lights up. If you add something like sucrose to the solution, then nothing happens. Um, the light bulb remains off. Sucrose, therefore, does not ionize when it hits water. So sucrose would be a good example of a non-electrolyte. Water is actually a good example, too. Water doesn't really dissociate much in water. It actually does dissociate a tiny bit to H plus and to OH minus. And by tiny bit, I mean um, about 10 to the minus 5% of water molecules dissociate. And it's even less than that. So it's, it's not many water molecules in a given solution would be dissociated into H plus and OH minus ions. So few that you would probably characterize water best as being a non-electrolyte. Now, a weak electrolyte, an example of a compound, so if a strong electrolyte example is NaCl, the idea here is sodium chloride and water is really sodium cations, each individually surrounded by water, and then chloride ions, each individually surrounded by water. And it's not really intact molecules or intact units or an intact solid lattice. Take something like acetic acid in water, Acetic acid is something we use often. It's the main component in vinegar. Now, acetic acid in water dissociates, but only a small amount. So a small amount of it dissociates into acetate ion and then into H plus ion. And this dissociation here is probably about 5% or so. It depends on a few variables, but let's say it's about 5%, meaning you have about 95% of your acetic acid molecules intact as the full acid molecule, and then a small component of those dissociate into um, the, in this case, the acetate ion and H+. So this is an example of a weak electrolyte. So if we had an example here of dissolving acetic acid, maybe we'll do this in class. If you dissolve a small amount of acetic acid into water, then the light bulb lights up a little bit. So it, it makes a faint light kind of indicative of a weakly electrolytic solution. So you get a little electrolytic behavior, but not a lot. And then the case of water, so few ions that it's practically speaking a non-electrolyte. That's why it's a poor conductor of electricity. But make something that makes a few ions, weak electrolyte, a lot of ions, strong electrolyte. Let's, let's here consider a couple examples of a strong electrolyte and think about how we might write these reactions. So a strong electrolyte might be something like KOH, potassium hydroxide. This is a solid. Dissolve it into water and it does dissolve. And so dissolve it into liquid water. You might write KOHAQ to kind of su suggest that we've gone from solid KOH, maybe we took the solid in terms of a test tube, add water, and then after time, it just turns into a solution. So it just turns into something where you can't quite see what's going on. What happens is what we can know since KOH is a soluble in this example, ionic compound, metal, non-metals. So we know it's an ionic compound that what has to go on is a full dissociation into potassium ions and then hydroxide ions. So we get K plus and OH minus forming in the solution as the two ions of KOH. So KOH dissolves in water. Another compound that dissolves in water is KNO3. So KNO3 dissolves re readily in water. And so KNO3 into water, we can even skip the step and just go right to the products of being K plus AQ and NO3 minus 
the intact ion. So our molecular ions that we learned how to name, those are going to stay intact. We're not going to form like nitride and oxide ions. We're going to keep nitrate intact and then K plus intact. So we get potassium and nitrate ions when KNO3 dissolves into water. Now every water-soluble ionic compound does this sort of step where it fully ionizes in water. That's how the compound dissolves in water in the first place. Now we can write out an example of the weak electrolyte. Our example was acetic acid. Turns out another example is HF. So when we compare these equilibria, uh, because what we get is a back and forth, an equilibrium between acetic acid, uh, we're gonna write this as AQ, so the dissolved aqueous molecule, and let me erase that just so that we're clearly writing AQ here, I'm not scribbling it. So AQ meaning aqueous, then we form some aqueous dissolved, water dissolved, acetate ion, and then H plus ions. Now in some examples, you might see water written here as a reactant, and then this be written instead as H3O plus. Same idea, this is showing an H plus ion dissolved by water a bit more explicitly in the case of H plus. So you'll see the reaction written two ways. So I'll write HF, I think the simpler way, AQ dissolving to form H plus ion, and then F minus. Now the idea of this equilibria arrow is to indicate that these are weak electrolytes, that are only partially dissociating to give the, the products over here. So they're only partially dissociating. Now how partial? Most of the weak electrolytes are well below 50%. So um, most of the molecules are going to remain intact as the molecule on the reactant side. And the very few, less than 50%, usually less than 10% or, uh, percent or so, are ionized. So a small amount of ionization occurs in these types of compounds. Now we'll start talking about weak acids versus strong acids a little bit later, but these are examples of things that we would um, later term to be weak acids. We'll introduce that term in a moment. Now we might compare and say, okay, when we're considering ionic compounds. Now let's backtrack for a second and make sure we realize that something like HF and acetic acid are molecular compounds. So molecular compounds, even though they ionize, doesn't make a, these compounds ionic compounds. So all acids, acids just contain H and nonmetal atoms, all acids are molecular compounds. Just so that we see that we're, we're really going to here kind of take a sidestep and just talk about ionic compounds for a minute and talk about their solubility rules. Okay, so we're going to talk about the solubility of solid ionic compounds. So remember earlier, liquids we might classify as, or we might say, are they miscible with each other? But solids, we're going to say, are they soluble in water? Or are they insoluble? Okay, so not all ionic compounds dissolve in water. And here are some solubility rules to help us know which ones dissolve versus which ones don't dissolve. And so some examples of soluble ionic compounds contain nitrate and acetate ions, and there are no exceptions. So what this means is if you pair any metal up with nitrate, so any metal cation with nitrate, it doesn't matter the charge, can be a minus, could be a two plus, a three plus. So you could take, for example, aluminum nitrate, AlNO33, that this is a water soluble compound because all compounds containing nitrate are water soluble. The same thing with acetate, that all compounds containing acetate ion are soluble in water as well. Okay, now another thing in the textbook, and it doesn't throw it into a chart like this, but other ions um, include the alkali cations. So alkali cations are always soluble, no matter what they're paired up with in terms of the anion. And likewise, the same for ammonium. So the ammonium cation, always soluble, no exceptions. And the alkali cations are always soluble uh, with no exceptions. So these are soluble with no exceptions, regardless of what anion they're paired up with. So no exceptions. And so then chloride bromide iodide dissolve in water, uh, mostly for most compounds. For most ionic compounds that contain those ions, with the exceptions of compounds, though, that contain silver plus, mercury one cation, and lead two cation. Okay, so what this means is we can actually write nine exceptions. Okay, so we can write that the following compounds would be insoluble in water, AgCl, PbCl2, and then HG2Cl2. That's the right formula for mercury-1 chloride. 
So these compounds here are all water insoluble. So these don't dissolve into water. And we can write the same compounds for bromide and for iodide, replacing the, the halogen here. Now notice we don't see the rules for F minus, a little more complicated for that anion, so we don't see, and it's also not all that commonly used, so we don't see fluoride listed for its rules. So we don't know how to classify the solubility rules for fluoride compounds like we can for chloride, bromide, and iodide compounds, but we can write the formulas though of nine compounds with those ions that are um, insoluble so that all the others must be soluble. So something that's soluble, calcium chloride, um, something else that's soluble, barium chloride. We can write basically any other metal ion paired up with chloride, bromide, iodide, know that it's soluble. Now sulfate is the last example of an ion that will have a rule for for its solubility. So sulfate, generally soluble, with the exceptions of strontium, barium, those are alkaline cations. Notice it doesn't list calcium. Calcium is also an alkaline, so it's only sometimes what we say to be the heavy alkalines, then mercury one and lead. So no silver ion like for chloride, bromide, iodide, um, and then also no calcium like the other heavy alkaline cations. Okay, so this means that Ag2SO4, according to this chart, would be soluble. This means calcium sulfate would be soluble. But it means that barium sulfate would be insoluble. This also means that um, lead sulfate would be insoluble in water. Now let's sidetrack for a second and talk about mercury, because mercury is interesting. We talked about naming that cation because mainly for this example here, it's in the chart. So I wanted us to be aware of what that cation was when we were naming things back in chapter two. Now, mercury will form salts that have a two plus charge. So mercury two plus is just simply HG two plus. HGCl2 exists. This is a um, compound that, that exists. This is water soluble. So do you see how it's only the HG2 two plus cation that's insoluble? So HGCl2 is soluble, but HG2Cl2 have two chlorides for every two silver um, atoms, then that compound would be insoluble. Okay, so soluble dissolves in water, insoluble doesn't dissolve in water, and we see some rules here to help us figure out based on the anion, and then in a few cases the cation, how to determine if the compound's soluble versus insoluble. So now we finally see four um, examples of anions that generally form insoluble compounds, but with a couple exceptions. So let's start with carbonate and phosphate. Carbonate and phosphate form ionic compounds um, that are generally insoluble, except when that cation is ammonium or an alkali cation. So ammonium carbonate would be water soluble, NH42CO3 would be soluble, but anything else paired up with it other than the alkali cations would be insoluble. So calcium carbonate would be insoluble in water. And so then the, uh, another example would be sulfide and hydroxide. Interestingly, these ions have the same rule as each other. I'm not sure why they're separated by the book and the chart, but, but they form uh, insoluble compounds, but with the soluble exceptions of ammonium cation, the alkali cations, and then calcium, strontium, and barium. So basically the same role as carbonate and phosphate, but with three additional exceptions. So calcium hydroxide would be water soluble, but magnesium hydroxide, not an exception, that's insoluble. Now calcium hydroxide, when it dissolves in water, would form calcium two plus and two hydroxide ions. It would exist as the ions in solution. Magnesium hydroxide wouldn't really be in the solution, so it wouldn't really exist in the solution. So it doesn't ionize because it doesn't dissolve. If a tiny bit of it happened to dissolve, it should ionize. So any type of ionic compound that might dissolve in water, if it's going to, it's because it ionizes um, in the solution. So it's worth pointing out that solubility is truly a continuum. So something like sodium chloride is very soluble in water, but it doesn't like infinitely dissolve in water. You can get about 350 grams of sodium chloride to dissolve in a liter of solution. That's about six moles of the compound. 
Now, in the case of calcium hydroxide, it's much less. You can only get about 0.01 moles of the compound to dissolve in a liter of solution. Okay, so now that's much less mass, but that's still about a gram of the compound into that liter of solution. So that's like still fairly soluble. Now there's a, a, a limit that we kind of draw a line in the sand and say about 0.01 mole per liter. It turns out to be about the, the solubility of calcium hydroxide, but below about 0.01 mole per liter solubility, a compound then just becomes termed as being insoluble. So I think it's like helpful to understand that even insoluble compounds do have a pretty low solubility, and some of them have a wide-ranging degree of solubility. Some compounds are very much insoluble. You can't get hardly any of the compound in the water. But um, something like lead iodide, which is termed to be insoluble, happens to have a solubility of about 0 0.002 moles per liter. That's like relatively soluble in terms of things that we classify as being insoluble. So I think it's helpful to understand at this point, and this is a topic that that um, that we get back into in chapter 17 in Chem 1220, where you start going over the chemistry of these compounds that are right on that threshold of being soluble, because it turns out you can control solubility. You can make some things that are almost insoluble in water become very soluble through doing some chemistry with the solution. And likewise, some things that are maybe slightly soluble, you can make them less, in, um, you can make them less soluble through some chemical means that you'll learn about later. So I think it's helpful to know solubility is really a continuum. There's a limit for each compound. We're not really going over the math. We're not really going to crunch any numbers or compare solubilities, but we can look at different compounds and say, well, some compounds are more or less soluble in water um, than others, but we're going to try to learn the rules so we can classify things either as being fairly soluble um, to highly soluble or things as just being not very soluble, hence we call them insoluble. So we're really just trying to make this soluble versus insoluble when really it is a continuum. So I hope that makes sense. And hopefully the recitation activity helps clear some of that up um, to bring some light to um, this issue of solubility. One of the primary ways that we will use the rules of solubility are for predicting when precipitation reaction, reactions can occur. These reactions occur when two solutions containing soluble salts are mixed and then an insoluble salt can be produced. And then this solid is called a precipitate. So an example is shown here. Let me zoom in on it so we can see this a little better. So if you take Ki, potassium iodide is water soluble. So that's an aqueous compound. Lead nitrate, all nitrates are water soluble. So that's an AQ, that's an aqueous compound. So you mix two solutions. Notice they happen to both be clear um, solutions. And when you mix them together, you see a solid form. The solid forming is not the KNO3 because that's water soluble. It's the PBI2. So what happens is your lead 2 plus, your K plus, I minus, nitrate minus, um, really your reactants are all just aqueous ions. So these are just K plus and I minus ions floating around in the solution. The PBNO3 2 is really lead and nitrate ions floating around the solution. But if the lead and the iodide bumping together, such that you get two iodides per lead, so you get the lead 2 plus still, I minus is pairing up, that forms an insoluble compound. We know it's insoluble, simply from the rules of solubility. And so since it's insoluble, it falls out of the solution. Generally, your solids will be um, have a greater density than water in the resulting solution. So usually your precipitates will float to the bottom simply as a matter of them being more dense. They're more dense because their ions pack together very closely. So you have a large mass per unit volume. And so, and it also happens to be that lead iodide is yellow. So you see this yellow solid. So how you can predict when a precipitate forms, when electrolytes are mixed, is to note the ions present in the reaction, consider the possible cation and anions switching pairs with each other, and then considering if those combinations lead to an insoluble compound. So for example, we can consider magnesium nitrate mixing with sodium hydroxide. So strong electrolytes means that magnesium nitrate is really magnesium ions and nitrate ions in solution. So M, um, MgNO32 plus NaOH, do we get something insoluble? These are water-soluble compounds. When they mix in water, we start with AQ compounds, and then we're going to form MgOH2. OH is a minus. Magnesium is a 2 plus, so we need two hydroxides. That's insoluble by our solubility rules. Magnesium is not one of the exceptions for hydroxide ion, 
calcium, strontium, and barium are in the alkaline group, but not magnesium. So this compound's insoluble, precipitates from solution, and then NaNO3 is the other product, water-soluble. And to balance, we're going to need two sodium nitrates, two sodium hydroxides, and everything else should be in balance. Now let's take a closer look at what's really going on in these reactions by examining the difference between a molecular reaction, considering the ions actually present in the reaction, and then identifying what we might define as spectator ions. And let's use our lead nitrate Ki example from the um, two slides ago. So if you have lead nitrate in water, we wrote that earlier as PbNO32 Aq plus 2 Ki. I'm just rewriting that equation to start with. And so that formed PbI2 solid plus KNO3 Aq, and then there were two of these. And so this is our full molecular reaction. So our, our full molecular reaction is simply the one written out with the full, if you will, molecules intact. Now lead nitrate really isn't a molecule, but we just call this colloquially, if you will, the full molecular reaction. Now what we have to know is that lead nitrate, an aqueous compound of an ionic compound, has to be a strong electrolyte, meaning it's really lead ions and nitrate ions. And then our Ki is really potassium ions, iodide ions. Now these are all AQs. So there's a lot of AQs to write, but usually I'll not write the AQ tag with ions because of course they have to be aqueous and dissolved by water. Now PBI2 is not a strong electrolyte because it's not dissolved in solution. So this is insoluble and remains intact as the solid. And then K plus AQ, and then nitrate AQ, two of them. Okay, now what we can see is that the lead ions and the iodide ions, I forgot to write the two in front of iodide. Um, so we get two potassium ions and two iodide ions. And so now it's our lead and our iodide bumping into each other, forming the solid that allows this reaction to occur in the first place. Like it's required that we form a solid, otherwise there would be no reaction occurring. We would just be mixing ions in solution and then nothing would change. Imagine if we didn't get the precipitate here. We just would have mixed two clear solutions and ended up with two clear solutions. That's really not a reaction. A reaction is leading to something new that forms that we can see with our eyes in this case, the lead iodide. Okay, now we can identify the spectator ions as the unchanged ions within a particular reaction. So that, in this case, are the nitrate and potassium ions. So these are the unchanged ions. Now, they don't disappear, but we can imagine them canceling out because they're on both sides of the reaction in identical forms. They're not part of the net change, okay? So we can reduce them from the actual net change. Now our net ionic reaction, so our net ionic reaction is just the net change taking place within this ionic reaction. Lead two plus, plus two iodide ions goes to PBI two. Now, these are just different ways of writing out the chemistry of what's going on in this reaction. The full molecular tells us what we're mixing together and what products ensue. The ionic reaction shows us all the ions that are reacting. And then the net ionic shows us the simple net change taking place within the reaction. So the lead and the iodide pairing up to make our new um, insoluble compound. And so then the spectator, spectator ions are important. They're still present, they don't disappear. They just drop off from the net change taking place uh, within the reaction. So let's come back to acids. Acids are substances that ionize in water to form H plus ions. So if you have something like HCl, this hits water and ionizes to H plus and Cl minus. HF looks very similar, but it only partially ionizes. We get this equilibrium to form H plus and F minus. So we get a complete formation of H plus and Cl minus from HCl. HCl is therefore a strong acid HF only does this partially, so HF is a weak acid. We get a partial formation of H+, so making any H+, makes a substance termed to be an acid. 
if you get a full formation of H plus for every one molecule, so if you get one H plus per molecule, then that would be a strong acid, and that would be the case of HCl. And so because H plus uh, consists of only a proton, acids are often called proton donors. You know, so hydrogen, one H plus, this whole atom just gains one proton. No neutrons, zero electrons. And so that's why sometimes you see an H plus just called a proton. Now sometimes you also see this idea of an H plus AQ written as H3O plus, and we name this as hydronium. This is the same idea of H plus. So H plus is sometimes written as H3O plus. So now some examples of acids are all the things we learned how to name that were acids. Hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, so HCl, HNO3, H2SO4. Um, and so notice you just have these like OH groups on top of the SO4 unit. Same thing on top of the NO3 group, HCl, acetic acid. Okay. Now bases are substances that accept H plus ions or they increase the concentration of OH minus in water. So one of the simplest examples of a base would be something like sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide and water is really sodium ions and hydroxide ions, just like any other ionic compound completely ionizes, but it just so happens to ionize to form OH minus ions. Now the reason why OH minus and H plus are kind of yin and yangs here, where H plus, if you make this in solution, you're an acid, if you make OH minus in solution, you're a base, H plus and OH minus pair up to make water. So they uh, work together in this way so that anything that makes H plus in solution is an acid, anything that makes OH minus in solution is a base. Now, a base can also be classified as something that accepts or reacts with H plus ions. So if you see ammonia, NH3, you probably know that's a base. Um, you now it's a base because it can react with something like water, take an H plus from water, form OH minus and NH4 plus. Now it does this partially, it doesn't completely react with H, um, H2O, it only partially reacts with H2O, so you only get a small formation of OH minus and NH4 plus, not a full 100% yielding reaction. So you get this equilibrium, this back and forth. So there's always some waters and NH3s colliding going forward, and there's always some OH minuses and NH4s colliding and going backwards in this dynamic equilibrium sense. So NH3 here would be defined as a weak base, so it partially makes some OH minus. Sodium hydroxide, every one mole, gives you one mole of hydroxide ions, so we define this to be a strong base. Now we also knew it to be a strong electrolyte to begin with, so a strong electrolyte, strong base. So sodium hydroxide is a strong electrolyte that happens to form the electrolyte hydroxide ion that we classify substances as bases when they produce that particular electrolyte. Now we haven't fully classified all of the strong acids and bases yet, so let's try to do that here. So strong acids completely dissociate in water. Weak acids only partially dissociate in water. And so our strong acids are, and there's seven of them, HCl, Br, and I, but not HF. So notice there's no HF on this list. That's a weak acid. HClO3, HClO4, HNO3, H2SO4. So chloric, perchloric, nitric, and sulfuric. And so it's only the first proton of sulfuric as well. So sulfuric acid goes to 100% H plus and HSO4 minus in solution. And then the HSO4 minus ion only partially goes to another H plus and an SO4 two minus ion. So this ion here we would define as a weak acid, not a strong acid. So only the first H plus falling off of H2SO4 does so to a perfect 100% yield. So those are our seven strong acids. Now all the other acids we learned how to name are weak acids. So weak acids include every other acid we learned how to name. So our weak acids could include, and I can't give you all of these easily, but some examples would be things like acetic acid, things like chlorous acid, things like, um, that's another good one, um, bromic acid. So any of the acid 
the acids you don't see listed as the seven strong acids that you know how to name as acids are weak acids. Now strong bases completely dissociate to give metal cations and hydroxide anions in water. So these are our water-soluble metal hydroxides. So lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium hydroxide, and then the heavy um, calcium, strontium, barium. Um, now ammonium hydroxide is a little complicated, so I don't want to dwell too much on this, but we're just going to classify the strong bases as our water-soluble metal hydroxides. And we're going to leave off the molecular hydroxide, the ammonium hydroxide for now. Um, so. So our strong, our strong bases are the ones that, um, that completely dissociate to give hydroxide ions with a metal pair, and then our weak bases are the ones that only partially react to produce hydroxide ions in solution. So an example of a weak base, and really our prototypical example here, is the NH3 molecule. So ammonia is a classic weak base, because it partially reacts in water, like we saw on the previous page, to only give some ammonium ions and hydroxide ions. So let's go through a summary. This is um, a table that's been in the book for years. It's probably the most misinterpreted table, table in the entire textbook. So this is table 4.3. Notice here it says the summary of the electrolytic behavior of common soluble ionic and molecular compounds. Okay, so the compounds have to be soluble to be considered in this chart. This compound or this chart is not considering insoluble compounds. So let's look at ionic compounds. So ionic compounds are either water soluble and hence strong electrolytes, or they're not in this chart. So you may look and say, well, you know, is PBI2 is insoluble. So you may be saying, well, what about PBI2? How do I use this chart to understand PBI2? Well, the answer is you don't, because it's insoluble. It doesn't make it a non-electrolyte, because uh, uh, to even be a non-electrolyte, the thing should dissolve and just not make ions in solution. PBI2 doesn't dissolve at all, so it's not a common soluble ionic compound. So there's no examples of weak electrolytes that are ionic compounds, no examples of non-electrolytes that are ionic compounds. There's only soluble strong electrolytes, because the ionic compound dissociates into ions when it dissolves, or the compound doesn't dissolve and therefore doesn't ionize and is not applicable to consider the electrolytic behavior. There is no solution. You just have water in the compound, so there, there's no solution to characterize. So now molecular compounds, um, now our molecular compounds, these include our strong acids. Those are our strong electrolyte examples. Now, the weak acids and weak bases, these would include things like HF, HNO2, acetic acid, all of our weak acids, and then ammonia as our prototypical weak base. Now, the thing that you don't see in the chart anywhere are the strong bases. Well, strong bases are ionic compounds. So they're included here. Strong bases are ionic compounds, not molecular compounds, because they, they are metal hydroxide compounds hence ionic. So to be an ionic compound, it's just metal, non-metal. So you're looking for metal, non-metal pairs, and then only non-metal atoms for molecular compounds. So HF, HNO3, HCl, HBr, etc. These are molecular compounds. You may look at HCl and say, well, it dissociates in water. Is that an ionic compound? It's not an ionic compound. It's still molecular. It's molecular because if you look at, say, HCl solid, you got to go down a really low temperature to freeze HCl. But if you do, um, and even doing so kind of proves the point that NaCl freezes at a much higher temperature, um, or you can think of it melting at a much higher temperature, because it has a much stronger attraction, because it's forming an Na plus Cl minus in that solid form and getting that strong ionic attraction. HCl is a molecule. It forms molecules that would be intermolecular, intermolecularly attracted to each other in a much different way than the cations and anions are attracted to each other in ionic compounds. So fundamentally different types of compounds, different types of properties, but they ionize in water just like the ionic compounds do. So we characterize that here as them being strong electrolytes. So our strong acids, strong electrolytes, weak acids and bases are weak electrolytes. And then all other molecular compounds that aren't considered to be acids or bases are non-electrolytes. So an example here might be methanol, might be glucose. 
Okay, now notice the formula of methanol has an H, has an OH, but it doesn't dissociate. It doesn't dissociate to give off hydroxide ions or H plus ions. It's a non-electrolyte. If it gave H plus ions, we would have called methanol some sort of acid. If it gave, it gave off hydroxide ions, we would have characterized the basic behavior of alcohols, but, but they don't form hydroxide ions in solution like ammonia does or calcium hydroxide. Now I want to contrast that with the formula for acetic acid that sometimes gets written this way. CH3COOH. Different type of compound. This is the formula also that's sometimes written as HC2H3O2. These are acetic acid. Now it looks like methanol, but totally different formula, different compounds, different names, different properties. Acetic acid's a weak electrolyte because it's a weak acid. Now let's consider some acid-base neutralization reactions. So we have HCl plus KOH. So we get the same type of plus, plus, minus, minus swapping and seeing if we can make something like an insoluble compound that doesn't back dissociate. And we do. And so in this case here, we're going to form H2O, liquid, non-electrolyte, not an acid or a base, and then we get um, the other product, KCl. And so this is a prototypical reaction. We get an acid plus a base that goes to a salt plus water. AQ salt. So it's forming this liquid that doesn't back dissociate that leads this reaction to taking place. Now you won't see a solid forming, you won't see a precipitate forming, um, but you will see this reaction occurring and you'll get rid of the H plus ions, the OH minus ions as they're forming water. And you can think about the full molecular reaction as well um, versus the net ionic. You can think of the H plus, the Cl minus, the K plus, the OH minus being separated ions forming H2O, which doesn't dissociate, so we leave that intact, and then plus K plus, and then Cl minus. So these would be our spectator ions, unchanged on both sides, so we can cancel them out and see that our net ionic reaction would be H plus and OH minus forming water. Now let's see how this is, um, differs. We have a weak acid like HNO2. So if we have HNO2 plus KOH, let me stick to a black pen. So that's going to form H2O plus KNO2. Now when we go to write our um, reaction here, KOH separates because it's a water-soluble ionic compound, but HNO2 is weak. We leave it intact. We can only fully dissociate things that fully dissociate in water. So HNO2 AQ, acids are water-soluble. They're reacting in acid, just not completely. And so then we're going to form H2O, liquid, plus K plus, plus NO2 minus. And so what cancels here is just the K plus. So in this case here, only the K plus ion is a spectator. Nothing else is the same on both sides. So our reaction, HNO2 plus hydroxide ion goes to H2O plus NO2 minus. That's our net ionic reaction. So our net ionic reaction, the net change uh, for HNO2, we leave it intact because it's a molecular compound that doesn't fully dissociate. Now phosphoric acid, now let's look at, it, at the case of having a different stoichiometry. So here we're going to form um, as our salt K3PO4. So we're going to fully react all three H pluses off of um, our acid. So we should lose all the H pluses, go down to that anion we learned how to name, phosphate ion. So potassium phosphate, AQ, and then water is our main product, our salt plus water. And so we're just going to get three waters and need three KOHs to produce them. And so then we think about our net ionic equation here. This would be H3PO4 plus 3K plus plus 3OH minus form. Now we leave the H3PO4 intact because it's a weak acid, not a strong acid, so it doesn't fully dissociate. We get 3K plus plus PO4 3 minus plus 3H2O liquid. And so our AQ um, phosphoric acid is in the um, net change. Our K plus though is not. It's what cancels out. 
and the net change. So our net change, H3PO4 plus three hydroxides go to a phosphate ion plus three H2O liquids. Now our final slide for today, calcium carbonate reacts with 2HCl um, to produce calcium chloride, but then we actually get CO2 and then H2O forming here. So sometimes we can have acid-base reactions occur with the formation of gas. If we take sodium bicarbonate and HBr, they produce sodium bromide. CO2 is given off as well, plus water. So the, um, uh, the idea here is if you go to form, you actually try to make H2CO3, that H2CO3 dissociates in water to give CO2 and water. So again, if you try to make, if you imagine making the H2CO3 here, it dissociates into CO2 and water. Sodium sulfide can react to give H2S. If you do this reaction, this is gonna smell like eggs. You better do this one in a hood or else it'll smell very bad. So you get your plus and your plus swapping pairs here for sodium sulfate plus H2S. So this is showing a couple examples where instead of having a hydroxide base, you have like a calcium carbonate, sodium hydrogen carbonate, sodium sulfide, producing some different types of gaseous products. So sometimes you get gas formation with acid-base reactions.